Okay, we're about ready to get started. Cool. I got no yeses, but no, no, don't start yet. Um, so uh, I've got a few topics to uh, cover today, uh, and I intended to just kind of forge bravely ahead into those topics, uh, but uh, uh, judging from kind of state of homework issues that have come up this past week uh, and some confusion back there, I'm going to do a little bit of review as we go through this stuff. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, this week's homework, and uh, there are, in fact, two of them this week, uh, so we can get the extra homework to displace whatever your lowest homework is. Uh, um, uh, it requires that you, again, set a... Uh, uh, a site backup on Bluemix. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's uh, a, a something that I'll cover in some more detail again today, uh, just as, uh, as a review. The things that I wanted to uh, start uh, fresh on today, though, uh, I've had a, a couple people ask about authentication and how you do uh, authenticated websites. Uh, and uh, so I'll cover that uh, not necessarily as something that you all need to do with authentication, but as an example of how you get functionality out of NPM packages and include it on your website. And so uh, I go through a bit of a discussion about how you find good packages. There are a lot of pieces of functionality up there on the NPM site, uh, but you've got to do a little bit of searching on how to use them. And so authentication is a good one to uh, talk about how to, uh, how to do that with. Uh, um, I have spent a bit of time this week cutting down the database example to something simpler, uh, and mostly on the input side this week. Uh, so uh, we won't talk a lot about doing queries against the database, uh, but uh, um, with this week's homework and uh, by the end of the class today, I really hope you'll all be able to uh, populate the database with what you need to for your own application that you're putting up there. And the sample that I've been uh, working through for the last couple of weeks uh, is a little bit more complex on that than most of you probably need for your application. Uh, we don't need to be able to uh, go to the file and get a file off the disk and put it in the database like it's doing. Uh, we just need to put text and maybe an image in there, but uh, really just text hits most of you guys. Um, so uh, walk through a simpler database example in there. And then uh, talking a little bit uh, about uh, EJS partials. Uh, so uh, we uh, just briefly touched on this last week. Uh, and a uh, partial uh, is a way of doing a fragment of a web page. Uh, but it's also a way of uh, doing uh, variables uh, and iterating over those variables to display them on a web page. Uh, uh, in a way that doesn't have to be in a script file, can be part of the page itself. Uh, so partials are a really useful concept. We'll be doing a bit of an exercise on uh, EJS partials in here tonight. Um, let me start with the uh, NPM packages side of things. Uh, so uh, uh, you guys have been using NPM uh, uh, mostly through the NPM install and NPM start commands, uh, but there's a fair amount more uh, to it than that. Uh, and at one point a, a couple weeks ago, uh, we uh, walked through this uh, package.json file. Uh, and so the package.json file uh, is basically uh, the uh, place that NPM comes into your project, and that's the joint uh, to uh, uh, make the different pieces of functionality other people have uh, created uh, run within your web server application. Uh, and so if we uh, walk through uh, kind of body parser and Cloudant and connect multi-party and EJS and error handler, all of these are things that extend the functionality of Node.js uh, with other bits of things that it can do. Uh, and uh, if you recall, when you, uh, the very first week we introduced this package, went through the uh, basic ones that were in here. There have been a couple more added since then. Uh, um, I've added the HTTP auth, which we'll be talking about in uh, some detail today. Uh, but uh, everything in here is uh, a way of extending the base Node.js functionality. And Node.js on its own uh, really doesn't do very much. Uh, it needs these packages in order to, uh, to extend anything. So when uh, one of the uh, groups came to me uh, and said, how do I do authentication on my uh, website? Uh, uh, they wanted to uh, propose a way that was not NPM based, uh, and I pushed them towards a specific NPM package. Uh, and uh, wanted to go through a little bit of the uh, thought process of how that, uh, that happens. Uh, if I just searched on NPM, uh, and this is npmjs.com, uh, for a package for authentication, I get 3,788 hits. These are different uh, ways that other people have wrapped authentication functionality up into an NPM package that I might choose to use within my application. Now, of course, this is silly. I can't uh, individually peruse uh, 3,700 different packages and decide which one to use. Uh, so my next step is really how to uh, narrow it down. And uh, the first way I do that is by making my uh, query as specific as possible. So I then queried for HTTP basic authentication. This is one of a number of different authentication modes, but it's kind of the uh, easiest one to wrap your head around how it works. It's just the uh, classic uh, 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 username and a password with those passwords saved in the file. And so that helps. That gets us down to 55 different or 51 different packages. Uh, 
but that's still more than I want to go try out the uh, packages on. Uh, and uh, so uh, what I do after this point uh, is I uh, usually go by maintenance, which sorts it by date, uh, and then I look at version numbers in here. Uh, and uh, so uh, if something has uh, been around a while uh, and has been updated recently, uh, that's very good. Uh, if it's in a version zero point something, I usually avoid it because that said it's, not, it's still in a beta, probably not ready for prime time yet. Uh, um, if it's in a one point uh, something, uh, I might try it, uh, particularly if it's been uh, very active or I've heard something about it. Uh, but if something's been around a couple of years and is in a version two or three or four, uh, that's a pretty good sign that it's being maintained uh, if it's had some changes to that package recently. Yeah. And so in this case, uh, we've got uh, HTTP auth uh, that uh, is uh, in a version 3.2 uh, and came up uh, second on the maintenance list, meaning it is currently maintained. Uh, the next things that I look at on here uh, is uh, the uh, Git history. Uh, and so uh, uh, if I go to um, npm js.com and uh, look for uh, think about it and look for HTTP auth since that's the one we were just talking about uh, then I'm going to uh, find that uh, it has on its uh, side over here uh, a uh, link to the github repository and so clicking on through to the github repository uh, I can see that, uh, yeah, nothing in the last few weeks, but things have been uh, updated in the last few months. Uh, and that's probably uh, a, a good sign on both sides. Uh, if I look at this and see uh, updated two days ago, updated three days ago, uh, then I've got to go look on the releases page and see, okay, where, where's the stable one? Where's the one that's not seeing things change every day? Because uh, that's what I want to use. Uh, but I see that this has uh, been updated a while back. Maybe there's another branch. Uh, uh, there's not even another branch that uh, is uh, on this. So it's uh, fairly stable, but updated within the last few months uh, and has basically the uh, functionality that I, uh, uh, that I want in there. So that's why I pointed you guys to uh, HTTP auth for uh, an authentication package. Uh, and then the last thing is I checked the license on it. Uh, uh, things can go up on uh, a, a Node.js with a variety of different licenses. Uh, MIT is probably the most permissive license that's out there. Right? It means you can use it for anything commercial or non-commercial. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, that uh, yeah, they can't uh, really put any restrictions on it later. So uh, active recently uh, in a uh, higher version number, uh, it, it does what you want, MIT licensed are uh, kind of the four things that I'll look for when I choose a uh, package out here. And I'll generally have to get as specific as I can on the uh, actual search criteria uh, so I don't get flooded with packages that, uh, that meet those uh, criteria. So HTTP auth uh, is uh, a uh, good package for Node. Uh, it does a few other platforms. We don't really care about those today. It also does some things beyond uh, HTTP basic auth. Uh, but again, we won't go talk about those at all today. Yeah. What I like about HTTP uh, basic auth is that uh, it really doesn't have a whole lot of connectivity uh, or uh, uh, your requirements and a whole lot of other concepts to wrap your head around. Uh, that uh, if you have a file somewhere that has uh, even an open text format, a list of uh, usernames and passwords, uh, you can set it up for HTTP basic auth to look at that uh, and uh, yeah, then use those as credentials for your users coming in. Now, of course, in a website that you were deploying on the, uh, the, the internet, uh, depends on the uh, security requirements for your data as to whether that's the most appropriate one. Uh, if I had a uh, site where I was storing credit card numbers and personally identifiable information and stuff, uh, I probably would not want to use basic auth, basic auth in an unencrypted fashion. Uh, even though that uh, file of uh, usernames and passwords is only on my server, no user can get access to that file. Uh, if somebody uh, did find a way of penetrating my web server and getting access to that file, uh, it'd cause a lot of problems. Uh, so with a lot of the uh, big uh, 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 password uh, hacks that have uh, come about in the last year or two, uh, you, uh, you read stories about them being MD5 encrypted. Uh, MD5 is a uh, pseudo encryption hashing scheme. Uh, that means that uh, the passwords that are stored in a file, and they're pulling uh, hundreds of thousands of passwords at once out of this file, uh, are uh, encrypted using something that stops kind of casual access. Uh, but MD5 is not a uh, suitable encryption scheme to uh, stop someone really determined. Uh, but you at least want to have this in this MD5 hashing scheme uh, if you're going to be storing it somewhere with uh, real people's passwords and uh, real users on the site. Uh, for this one, I don't want to wor worry about any of that and just talk about how do we do a basic authentication, uh, assuming that on the server side where uh, only you should be able to access, people can put their real passwords in there. 
Um, the other thing that HTTP Basic Auth does uh, is uh, uh, uses uh, server uh, yeah, very, or client uh, side variables rather uh, to uh, store the uh, yeah, the cookie that says it's been authenticated. So basically, every time you close the browser, you've got to reauthenticate. Uh, um, you have the option of saving uh, if you uh, save passwords locally, so that it fills automatically again. But the server is going to ask you to uh, reauthenticate uh, each time a new browser session is instantiated. So this means each time you fully close down the browser, open a new browser, and point to your server's website. Um, there's no way of logging out with basic authentication. It's really just uh, destroying the connection in the browser, and then when you log back in, it'll ask again. Uh, this means that uh, I often use incognito mode to test basic auth applications. Uh, this is when you uh, go up in Chrome and say incognito, it opens a new window uh, that doesn't store any of your local information on it. Uh, and this just ensures that the browser has to ask again, uh, and uh, so you can re-authenticate from scratch to make sure your authentication is working. Um, you do have a bunch of other auth options, as I was saying. Uh, one of the uh, ones that uh, is most attractive, if you want to go deeper into uh, authentication with this uh, project you're writing, uh, is two-factor authentication. Uh, I use this for my Gmail, uh, where uh, if I log on from a new machine, I have to actually use the Authenticator app on my phone uh, and uh, authenticate that I want to be logging in from that machine that it's actually me. Uh, and uh, you can actually, uh, with a lot of sites uh, now, uh, even do three-factor auth, where you've got an authentication app, uh, and then it sends you an email or a, a text message, depending on how you set it up. Uh, and this just means that if somebody uh, cracks one channel, say they steal my laptop and it's open and uh, my password has uh, already been entered, uh, they still can't log on to sites that I'm logged out of uh, because they have this other authentication strategy to, uh, to block it. Uh, so there's a good tutorial uh, on uh, the uh, IBM site uh, to uh, use two-factor authentication on Bluemix applications, and they've got some tools to make that a little bit easier. Um, it's still really not as easy as the uh, basic auth, uh, so uh, we're going to stick with basic auth for the act activities we do today. Yeah, but uh, uh, that's another uh, thing to look into if you want to go uh, one step deeper on authentication. OAuth is another scheme uh, that, uh, and this is actually what I uh, do for most of the applications I write now. Uh, an OAuth provider is able to provide a credential saying that people have logged into my site, uh, and uh, when you, uh, for instance, use Google to authenticate to another site, you'll see a screen that says, uh, uh, do you want to allow uh, uh, foo.com to uh, 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 use your uh, Google to authenticate? And you say yes. Uh, and if you go into uh, Google, there's a list of sites that uh, have been allowed by you to uh, use Google as authentication for them. This does not mean that those sites have access to your Google credentials. There's no security risk to your Google account by doing that. Uh, it means that uh, they've agreed to establish an OAuth connection uh, with those sites that when you uh, use uh, Google and you're on a machine that's logged in by Google, uh, they can automatically be logged in as well. And it just means that you can do a single sign-on or a single log-on more easily and have it go across multiple sites that you may want to, uh, to visit. So OAuth is really kind of the, uh, uh, the way that uh, I do uh, real website authentications. Uh, again, today, though, we'll stick with the, uh, the basic options. So I also want to point you to a, another site here, uh, the uh, uh, Mozilla.org uh, site. Uh, and uh, that's got a uh, pretty good description of uh, the uh, different built-in authentication mechanisms uh, and why you might want to, uh, uh, to use them. We won't go into any uh, great detail, but uh, most common HTTP scheme is basic. Um, and uh, again, this is uh, mostly from HTTP days rather than HTTPS. Uh, uh, there are new schemes that take advantage of uh, the uh, secured browser connections, uh, um, but uh, most of the sites we're writing in here are not. Uh, I don't think anybody's actually doing HTTPS for their site in here. Uh, uh, you've got to buy a certificate and stuff. And so HTTP basic is uh, what we'll, uh, we'll stick with. So let me uh, show you how I integrated that into uh, the, uh, the Bluemix application we were working with last week. I'm going to be going through uh, this uh, AuthDB application, uh, which uh, is something that I basically just started from the same Bluemix uh, starter sample app that we've been looking at for a few weeks now, uh, but I've been modifying it, uh, and I wanted to have my modifications uh, in the commit log. Uh, and I'm going to show you a little bit about how I use that as a way of browsing through uh, a commit history and looking at the changes. Uh, Part of what I want to get out of today's uh, class uh, is how you take a fairly complex sample application, uh, and this was still fairly complex. There were uh, you know, a couple dozen files required to make it do its thing, uh, and start breaking it down to understand what it was doing uh, so you can repurpose it for your own applications. And so I'm going to be walking through a bunch of my commits uh, and uh, showing you what I changed and what I looked at as I started to repurpose this sample application. In the course of that, we'll go also back through uh, 
what you would need to change on that uh, application as you're putting your website application into uh, into Bluemix. Uh, but we'll only just kind of touch on that since we covered that in such detail last week. So I'm going to uh, is not do the initial commit. This was just where I checked in uh, the uh, the code from Bluemix directly. Uh, and then that next one was where I uh, did uh, the uh, VCAP local change and uh, get ignore. Uh, I, I, of course, uh, VCAP local no longer exists in here, uh, but I think I initially forgot to add it to uh, uh, get ignore. That's why I have this intermediate one here. Uh, um, but uh, I am going to uh, start with uh, this step where I added basic auth. Uh, and so the way I'm going to do that uh, is I'm going to go ahead and copy the uh, SHA. Uh, that's the uh, a signature basically for this check-in for that commit message uh, and I'm going to uh, go to uh, my uh, console window where I am uh, in my OffDB site uh, and I'm going to do a git checkout command and I'm going to check out that commit message that I just uh, I, I copied and so now it's going to uh, say uh, checking out uh, you're in a de detached head state uh, what this means is that if I make changes based on this I'm going to have to do something special with those changes in order to put them back into my commit history. Uh, because right now in my uh, commit history, uh, I'm uh, uh, back at this point uh, in uh, maybe 10, 12 commits ago. Uh, and so that's what's going to uh, be uh, the head that I'm working from. And of course, if I make changes to these files and check in, it's not going to know how to integrate them with this one and how to reapply all the other ones in my commit history. So it's basically going to require me to create a new branch to check in any changes I make. Um, I don't mind. I'm just looking at things. I'm not going to save the changes in my detached head state. And then I'll go back to the, uh, uh, the actual head before I actually save any changes. So I'm just looking at things for right now. Um, if you want to create a new branch to retain the commits you create, uh, can do so now or later by using minus B for the new branch from the checkout. So that uh, git checkout minus B with a new branch name. Uh, would let me create a new branch that started from this point if I wanted to carry on developing from there rather than uh, reintegrating back with the head of my current branch. Okay, so uh, looking at this, uh, this is still the same application. Uh, let me uh, go ahead and start that, npm start. We'll think about that. I've just got some uh, little debug notices that I've put in there, but it's listening on port 3000. Uh, and uh, it couldn't create my sample DB. It might already exist, but it was able to create the, uh, oh, the other one isn't in there in this version. That's why. Okay. So now I'm going to go to a new incognito window because I'm testing authentication. I always want to have it be in a yeah, new browser instance. And I'm going to go to localhost 3000. Lo and behold, it asked me for authentication. I'm going to authenticate as Derek with a test pass. And then it will bring up the uh, same page we're all familiar with, uh, with files we've been looking at for a, a few weeks here. So that's how basic authentication works. Uh, let's now go uh, into the code and uh, look at what makes it work. And probably the first place to uh, do this uh, is uh, actually to look at the commit. So if I don't go to copy that uh, hash, but rather the one next to it, it will go to that commit. Uh, and that will show me uh, what uh, has changed in the files. And there have been three changes with 27 additions and uh, seven or 23 additions and seven deletions. And so uh, looking at it uh, in here, we can get a uh, really good idea of what has to uh, change. The first thing I want to point out is I've created this new file, public data passwords. And this public data passwords file is simply a text file. Uh, and that has uh, the uh, username and the password for each of the uh, passwords I want to allow to access my website. The second thing is, is that uh, I actually have uh, the uh, um, HTTP auth uh, uh, in my uh, package.json. Now, it rearranged some of the others, uh, but it doesn't too much matter uh, about that rearrangement. You'll see that it took away cloud, uh, connect multi-party from there and added it to here, uh, took away cloud from there and added it to here, EGS from there and added it to here, uh, um, Express from there and here. Morgan there and here. So everything else is still in there. It's just moved it around. Uh, and I don't really know why uh, package.json changes the order of its files sometimes, uh, um, but it does. So you can basically ignore moved files uh, where one line is deleted and uh, recreated somewhere else in your package.json. That's not a real change. The only real change there was adding HTTP auth. And the way I did that was not by directly editing package.json. Uh, 
the way that I did that was uh, by uh, in my uh, terminal window here uh, saying uh, npm install minus minus save HTTP off. And it's probably not going to actually do that since it's already included in the package, uh, but uh, uh, who knows, it, uh, it, it may try. Um, and what that minus minus save does uh, is uh, says, uh, yep, go ahead and put that into uh, the, uh, 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 the package.json file, uh, and uh, so you'll actually use that now. Now, I wonder if that actually uh, changed my, uh, no, it didn't, great. So uh, uh, it left them in the same order that time. Otherwise, when I did get status, it would have said one file changed package.json, uh, and I would have had to have reverted it uh, in order to get back to uh, the state where I can go back to a different commit. So that is the uh, uh, the uh, package, uh, and then I needed to do a, a couple more things in here. Uh, um, I needed to uh, uh, set up the authentication module. So saying var uh, auth, uh, yeah, require HTTP auth. Uh, we've looked at the require statement before. Uh, this is the same way you do a require on Express, for instance, to load your web server inside Node.js. Uh, but here I'm loading the authentication package, calling it uh, auth, uh, and then I'm creating a, a variable uh, a, 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 called basic, uh, which sets up the auth basic. One of the elements of uh, HTTP basic authentication is that you need to give it a realm. A realm is simply a fancy term saying a set of web pages that use the same authentication. So if I had five different pages that were all part of the same site, uh, and they all shared this same realm, uh, then you can log in once and have that login carry across all those sites. Uh, but if I, I then went to a different uh, website altogether on a different server and it was uh, uh, yeah, using a different realm, uh, it would make me log in separately on that site. So anything you want to have within the same authentication collection, essentially, uh, you call it as being in the uh, same realm there. And I tell it where the file with my passwords is. That's what uh, this part of uh, basic auth is. I didn't need to console log it, but I wanted to uh, see out in the uh, log what was going on here. Uh, and uh, that uh, is uh, where some of the messages that uh, came up. Uh, it was telling me that uh, the options, um, the basic options, the events, uh, events count, uh, that it's got the realm and the file, and uh, that they've got a 401, 407 message. Uh, uh, these are just kind of the things that the package itself sets up as uh, things that are required for basic authentication. So I didn't have to add those. They just uh, came with the, yeah, the package. And then you just have to add this uh, one line here uh, that uh, is uh, the app.use auth connect basic. And that will make anything in your app.js that follows that line require authentication or in order to be accessed. So let's look at, uh, at this in the uh, Visual Studio Code here, uh, because that's a, an important statement I'll we'll want to come back to in just a, a few minutes. Oh, there we go. So I knit the DB connection. Um, wait a minute, I put it even before that, didn't I? Yep, I did. So I put app use auth connect basic right at the very top of my uh, app.js file, which means that everything else in that app.js file will require authentication to be connected to it. Uh, this is not just your uh, direct web pages uh, where you're uh, defining the routes to that web page, uh, but also your data pages. Uh, so when I uh, define a uh, a page to just get me uh, to attach a file to uh, my uh, database. Uh, that's also a route that will require authentication. So if that happened to be the first thing that was hit, you'd still have to log in before it did that. Uh, now you can change what gets uh, authenticated uh, by where you place that statement. Uh, if I wanted a set of files on my website to not require authentication and a different set to require authentication, I would put this app use auth connect basic further down in my app.js file and everything that I did not want to require authentication would appear above that statement, and everything I did want to require authentication would appear below that statement. I'll show you an example of this in uh, just a few commit messages here. I think that's all that uh, happened in the initial uh, commit for authentication. So I should probably pause at this point and see if people have questions about how authentication uh, in its most basic form was implemented in here. Okay. Cool. Then I shall carry on. So let's go back and look at uh, my uh, commit history here. Um, 
you know what? Let's not go back and look at my commit history because I think I want to uh, double check in slides what I'd intended to do after this. Uh, it was. I, I'd intended to have you, since you all now have a running application, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be on Bluemix, it can be on your local site. Uh, um, I'd like you guys to uh, do those steps and add basic authentication. Uh, and I'm going to leave the uh, page up that has my commit history uh, and the uh, basic auth uh, so that you can see what was uh, was actually changed in there. Um, and actually, it's the app.js change that is the uh, most complicated in here, so that's the one that I'll, uh, I'll leave up on the screen. If you do not currently have a local website running, uh, then uh, yeah, let me know and I will help you debug that during this break uh, rather than having you work on basic authentication. We'll take maybe uh, 10, uh, 10, 12 minutes on uh, this one, uh, but let me know if you all get done with that before that. Feel free, of course, also just to go to github.com slash directja.auth-db to see my changes directly and just copy them out of there if you want. So this is a different uh, Express app. Uh, it's one point. Uh, it's fine. Uh, it's uh, it's fine. Uh, and uh, so it works. Uh, it's So app.js uh, is uh, somewhere here that was used in the app, and that is that to the idea of good exposure to the app. Now, that is going to say on the app, yes, right here in the app. And that would be an idea to use. And that's just the same Basically, because this degree in the direction wants to serve as a lot bigger website, uh, with, uh, it, it, it's in, uh, if you were to have one file that uh, you would want to uh, contain the one page, it would make it really absolutely. And so, the larger website uh, is really going to start. It also needs to be so it's not very nice and weird. A slash is the root of the website. If you were to build it, you get a variable back of that. That's the root. If you were to give it a different page, it's 
Did this get out what you're asking about with your organization? You can't read them on the um, It kind of depends on if you want any authentication. Uh, and, and I don't think you need it. Uh, it, 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 it kind of scenario with the part of it. Uh, so I might suggest you actually create a new program on Linux and uh, I have it create the uh, server package code for you, pull that into the red screen, uh, and then you can install it and start uh, an application. Just, uh, or if you do do it in your project, uh, you can throw it away after we can get it.
<laughs> if you click on index that day, uh, you'll see that there is a group defined for each of these that choose to be under something that's format that uh, for each of the other ones you find. And then instead of pointing to the running category, you'll point to whatever your is not all you can do. Sure. So, so tell me what uh, describes me where you're. Okay, so you copy it from together. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's a harder way to do it. If you understand it all very, very deeply, uh, that is the most But I would actually recommend uh, starting from the package itself, making sure the package itself runs, uh, and then moving files in the back. The problem is here is there's going to be a number of changes uh, that uh, uh, you won't really know how to do. Um, <coughs> the manifest.yn helping that when you create a new package, uh, it might be a 500 site and doing it. So it creates a new manifest.yn and that creates to uh, a new manifest.yn is that and get very potential for that. And uh, by hand, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, so I would start a new uh, plug in that by uh, uh, this was the get uh, plug in starter guy uh, or no jam plug in that start yeah, that would be get plug in for each site that's right. So I would start a new one of those uh, and then uh, uh, create the uh, GitHub uh, 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 this group over uh, to uh, put that in and uh, put the, uh, that into uh, their uh, expand the get files uh, and uh, then uh, I would run it and I would run it on the internet to make sure you can push it. And I think Danny did a bunch of that, uh, um, but I don't know the actually share it with the rest of you all. Uh, so uh, at some point, you have to figure out uh, where are your uh, your project you're going to turn into groups. Um, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
So you can sometimes walk on this book. Yeah, and I said it in the so you can kind of buy it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that certainly would do it, but I don't understand why it's people get more of them. Yeah. Um, I guess if that fixed it for a while, I'll have it right now. But uh, it means that something is running in the process in the background on uh, that uh, is uh, not. Because it should be expressly serving that port, and it's not running anywhere other than that. So if you close it manually all together, uh, did that, uh, that happen? It didn't. So it's somewhere you're going to use the map. Okay, let's go on. Yeah, there's no Yep, that's right. Yeah, just create the directory and then you get it. Uh, oh, uh, so that only works for NPM, but to add the package, uh, if you're in the root of your uh, uh, if you're in the root of your directory, then, so uh, how that's working. Okay, yeah, right, okay, right. Um, and so if you say uh, npm space install uh, minus minus save space HTTP yeah. dash off. <laughs> <laughs> Then that'll add to your package that is on. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, the Uh, only if you want to see it uh, happening locally, and I wouldn't see it happening locally just because you're making any changes when I see it won't come out. I always so develop. No. I, I, I think it's totally reversed because every time you make a change, uh, if it's only on Linux, you've got to wait the uh, two or three minutes to uh, so work that push on Linux. Whereas if you do it now, well, you can, uh, all you have to do is uh, control C and then you get the current So it's just much faster than it's going to work on Linux. You can do it either place. Yeah. Just, This is uh, one of the reasons why I think 
So that means you don't have to every time we're looking Here's the uh, actual word, that uh, you don't have it on the password. So that should be a directory in the password file. <laughs> Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, so, mm -hmm. so that code is not on the Linux one even directly with the starter package from it. Um, I can show you how to find the starter package from it, but I don't know how to find it or find you, because then every time I have to work with it, I'm looking back to the starter package. Um, if this is not in the GitHub, 
Um, then I would not use that. I mean, you can, you can build another one on the same account, yeah, I, 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 but, uh, but I would start with something from you. Um, simply that you can start pushing on the page. But he's pushing on the page. Yeah, so you have a repository, uh, and uh, if you look to your Linux site, your console will uh, be that Linux site. There's the answer. Yeah. 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 Sorry, uh, just uh, this is just a Is that the root of your plugin? Um, but you see it's only got a dozen or so files up there and maybe it's not going to fill them up with it. Oh, did you get a hell of a software? No, I didn't see it. Well, I still don't see it. I get it. Mm -hmm. What the hell is your dog getting more? <laughs> um, well, doing LS one is LS. It's a dog problem. So, um, <laughs> that dot get ignored is where it's got to be under R, but why is it times it's not? He took that one. Uh, 
You guys are all doing this too. Yeah. So you're right I don't Sorry, I had you on the ad, but not on the Because your one root index.js defines all of your error that uh, that HTML can also get loaded up.
So it is finding all of your roots, but for some reason that you know. <coughs> um, no, I think that's where it has to be. Um, <laughs> as long as it works, I will walk away. Oh, they said I got to make a point for the second time.
So with it working there and not working on your page, um, let's dig into what you did. Um, come back to Visual City Church. And let's look at that uh, page and change. Um, you have your stuff there as well. Um, I guess looking for a J. If you just put class in the class for HTML, does that work? Mm -hmm. No, not that one. You just said class. Or if you do that, you can get a JPL. You did try that out. Okay, so it's requiring a JPL file, not an HTML file, um, which means you're going to have to rebrand data if you want to do the JPL. Um, JPL is not a complete. I don't know how many else you hit this also, but cloud on uh, the US South uh, IBM cloud seems to be down at the moment. <laughs> Simply throw things at walls. <laughs> let's let's do something else for a little bit, uh, and hopefully uh, IBM gets their shit together uh, before we uh, try something else on their cloud. Good God. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. Some of you guys uh, close to authentication getting working. Uh, um, if we were in our own project that didn't hit IBM, we could still play with authentication, uh, but that seems kind of pointless. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's carry on and talk about EJS for a while. So um, Jonah was working with a, uh, a sample application back here uh, in a templating language called Jade. Um, there are a number of different templating languages. Uh, uh, what a templating language basically is, uh, is a uh, way of taking data in and displaying it on a uh, web page in a kind of semi-standardized format. Uh, and so they'll let you do things like uh, 
uh, iterate over different data items uh, and have each uh, iteration produce a line in a table or uh, iterate over and have each of them produce a button. Uh, but you can iterate over data and make that uh, create your page dynamically for you. And it's often very useful to have your page created dynamically because then you're not typing in each uh, line by hand or uh, you can kind of get things generated and data driven. Uh, so uh, Jade and Handlebars uh, and uh, EJS uh, and uh, uh, there are several others as well uh, are uh, all uh, different languages for achieving this. I like EJS because it's fairly simple. Uh, it's a very small vocabulary. It's easy to get started with. Uh, it's not as flexible. Uh, Handlebars is the one that I'm using actually in a lot of my uh, commercial sites right now, uh, but uh, it has a steeper learning curve. And so I wanted to start us on EJS, and that just happened to be the uh, templating engine uh, that uh, the cloud site uh, yeah, that we used as a starting point from uh, Bluemix uh, used as well, although it didn't actually make use of it for anything. I noticed that it included it in the package.json, but didn't actually make any EJS calls. So EJS, uh, uh, I pointed you to this tutorial uh, uh, last week, uh, and uh, we didn't really uh, do much of, uh, of anything with it. Uh, um, I don't think we will this week either, uh, but if you're trying to uh, do stuff on your own to remember what we did, this is a very good uh, tutorial to start with. Uh, the other one uh, that uh, I use a lot uh, is this embeddedjs.com site, uh, and this has all the syntax for uh, uh, EJS, and that's a really good one to uh, look at instead. What I wanted to do today uh, was to uh, uh, do an exercise uh, using this site uh, uh, it, it, that I'll uh, leave up in just a moment, uh, it, it, that um, is basically a playground. Remember when we were using uh, the uh, uh, JS uh, Fiddle, uh, I think it was, that we started with the first couple of weeks uh, when we didn't have any local install? This does the same thing for EJS, unless you compose EJS uh, examples uh, on a uh, cloud uh, playground. And so, uh, for instance, this one right now is uh, listing a bunch of fruits and then repeating a bunch of random numbers uh, and then iterating through those fruits uh, and uh, yeah, putting them up on, uh, on screen. And it's using a few things to do so. When you've got uh, the uh, angle bracket percent sign symbol here, that's basically saying that everything that's in between the angle bracket percent uh, and percent angle bracket uh, is a bit of JavaScript code. And it's JavaScript code that uh, is just like the JavaScript code you've been writing in script tags. Uh, except for the fact that its scope is different. And what I mean by its scope is different, remember we talked about variable scope a few weeks ago, where if you uh, define a variable within a function, it's only accessible within that function. If you define it at the top of the file, it's accessible to all functions in that file. Well, the scope difference here is your handlebar uh, or your uh, EJS uh, uh, function uh, has access to a greater scope than your other uh, uh, JavaScript variables. It has access to the scope of the local variables from the application that were declared inside of your Node.js application. And so what this means is that you can use EJS as a way of passing variables from your server-side code down to your client-side code being used through the templating engine. Really, really important. We'll come back to that one uh, in uh, just a few minutes, uh, hopefully after Cloudant works again. Uh, um, uh, yeah, but uh, you want a way that you can have your server-side code create things on your web page, and EJS and having that greater scope template is one really good way of doing that. A few other things that you'll notice uh, in here. Uh, so uh, we have this uh, open uh, angle bracket percent equals. That means that you're to take the contents of a variable and directly print it out on the HTML page. So this is how you actually take the variables and spit them out on screen is with that equals uh, uh, symbol. Uh, then there are a couple others. Uh, they don't uh, get used in this example, I don't think, uh, but uh, there is uh, an angle bracket minus or a percent minus, uh, and that trims leading spaces, uh, or a uh, minus percent angle bracket, which trims uh, following spaces. Uh, there are some formatting things you can do in there as well. So I'd like to get you guys to uh, uh, do a bit of an exercise on this playground. Uh, this is uh, uh, at the URL that's up on the top there. Uh, and I uh, would like you to uh, uh, take a uh, list of five animals, and for each animal, have a script calculate the number of letters in the name of that animal, and list those values, uh, either next to the animal or beneath that animal, whichever you, uh, uh, you like. Uh, and uh, point to that embedded JS uh, uh, script as a sample for how to do that, uh, and then if you hit that link, you'll see uh, the uh, numbers and, uh, uh, you know, what was it, uh, fruits uh, application come up on top of it. 
but I'll leave it on this page so you can actually get those links to uh, to point up to to uh, to try this. And that will keep us off the Bluemix cloud for hopefully long enough for them to fix it. Sorry, I'm also realizing it's 7 20 and we haven't taken a break yet, so feel free to take a break anytime during the dance exercise. Yeah. <laughs> My slides are on SlideShare that night, by the way. They're not. Oh, but I put them there before class. Oh, bloody. I'm sorry. I'm going to swap away from this screen for a minute and find them.
certainly thinks they are. Oh God, I keep doing that. It tells me it's public when I upload them and then I uh, come back later and it says private. Sorry about that, now they're up there. Actually, Mitch, I don't think that's the issue in that uh, I was able to find the, uh, the, the full detail on that uh, notification tab, and it said that uh, a duration was issued uh, between 913 UTC and 1628 UTC, which sounds like it's in the past. I don't know how to convert from UTC to specific in my head, but that, uh, yeah, so I think that's, I think that's over. 
Has anybody else had any uh, website freeze on that playground? You have as well. Okay. Oh, maybe we're overstressing it by having everybody hit it at once. I'd suggest working uh, in a text editor and writing your code out on that and then copying and pasting into the uh, thing so you don't lose it all if it crashes.
That gets you part way there. Anybody else for closer than that? Um, quite some time ago, but um, let me put a basic for loop on the uh, the board up here. So this is the basic structure of a for loop. Uh, and uh, so what this is saying is that uh, for, and then the uh, ordinary uh, brace uh, uh, variable i equals zero, i is less than five, semicolon i plus plus, and then everything inside these curly braces will get executed from when i equals zero, then we'll get executed, when i equals one, then we'll get executed, two, then it'll get executed, three, same, four, same, and then five, it'll hit this condition and won't get executed anymore. So that's basically the uh, structure you'll need, the looping structure you'll need uh, to uh, work your way through uh, the uh, list of animals that you declared in the same way the list of fruits were declared for you at the start. Does that help clarify? The other thing that's up here you should think about is that dot link, that every element uh, of an array has a uh, dot link property, as well as the array itself having a dot link property. And up here I've used my animals dot link, which is the length of the array, so I have four items in my array. But every single one of those uh, will also have a dot link uh, your property that will tell you the length of the uh, subarray string. Yes and yes. The animals work. Cool. <coughs> Take just uh, two or three more minutes here, and we'll uh, talk through the solution.
Everybody now have a for loop in their solution? And you're now just trying to work on how to get a length of the individual items? So basically what I was looking for in here uh, was uh, a uh, <coughs> the animals were declared at the uh, top the same way the fruits were in the uh, piece that you uh, started with. Uh, and uh, then we've got this uh, angle bracket syntax again to uh, declare a piece of code. And so the code that was being declared was this for loop. Uh, again, uh, you uh, declare a variable in the for loop and uh, where the variable is starting from, where the variable is ending at, and the increment. And so in this case, it's incrementing the I++ is a short form for add one every time it goes through the loop. Uh, and where it's ending at uh, is uh, a, a, as long as I is less than animals.length. And so in this case, animals.length uh, is uh, equal to four. And uh, uh, so as long as uh, i is less than four, it will keep carrying through the loop. And what it's going to do is it's carrying through the loop uh, is say equals animal i, so give me the name of the animal, and then colon in a few spaces, and then equals animals i dot length, so giving me the length of the animal's i, the number of characters within that uh, particular animal's name. Does that make sense? The piece I wanted to get out of that, aside from just a bit of a review of uh, uh, variables and arrays uh, and for loops, uh, was uh, uh, yeah, this idea that the uh, angle bracket percent equals uh, always turns into a variable that then gets substituted into your HTML page. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to uh, walk through uh, in uh, just a uh, moment here uh, some things you can do with that uh, inside your project uh, to create partials. Uh, and in particular, uh, creating partials is really useful for things like headers and footers that you'll use on each and every page. And you don't want to repeat them uh, on uh, each HTML page just because it's better to write things uh, once and then uh, include them than it is to uh, write things many times and have them get out of sync with each other. So questions about this example? Uh, are we ready to dive back into project code to look at how they get used in an actual application? Everybody get this to work? Cool. Let me get this back minus. No. I'm going to pop back to here. And uh, so there was the solution. We just talked through uh, yeah, that uh, in uh, short form. Um, the main thing that uh, has really kind of been a uh, learning curve for me on EJS uh, and uh, uh, partials uh, is how to actually pass around variables uh, from the server uh, and uh, from my uh, other variable or from my other uh, JS code that was in here. Uh, and so I'm going to talk through this in some detail uh, in uh, my project. Um, let me uh, come back uh, and... Um, figure out which version of my project to go to for this. So it was right up near the end on that. There I am. Uh, so actually, I'm just going to go back to the head. I uh, want you to notice how I'm doing this, by the way. Uh, so I uh, did the uh, a, a git checkout to a particular uh, yeah, spot uh, to uh, go back in my commit history. Uh, now to get back to uh, where I uh, want to be uh, at the head, I uh, go git checkout and then the name of the branch, master. And so that's going to uh, uh, bring my branch all the way up to date. Uh, so uh, here I am right back up at the head of the, uh, the branch again. So you can do that anytime you want to go back and look at something you checked in and compare it to uh, what you currently have. Uh, uh, get checkout and then to that commit uh, signature and then get checkout and the name of the branch takes you back to the uh, head of that branch. So let me go ahead and uh, start the head of that uh, branch again. There we go. Lots of stuff there. 
And I'm going to uh, just prove to myself that this is actually uh, working. It is. And uh, I didn't add authentication there, but I did add authentication to a, uh, another, uh, well, I thought I'd added authentication. Maybe I turned it back off. Um, in any case, um, what I wanted to point out on this uh, page in my uh, application, uh, and it doesn't look like much, but there are a couple of variables here. Uh, there's this test variable, uh, and then there's my uh, name, Derek, and they come from different places. Uh, and I'm going to walk through how they got into the uh, partial for the footer. Uh, so uh, let's go into uh, Visual Studio Code, uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, first uh, look at the footer which doesn't have a whole lot in it, uh, but uh, is uh, basically uh, just showing that it's this uh, uh, EJS par partial, footer.ejs, uh, and that it's the class footer. Uh, and then the only thing that looks like EJS syntax that I have in here is this uh, uh, percent equals u percent uh, caret. Uh, and so this is saying spit out the variable u uh, that uh, is, uh, is in there. And um, so let's figure out where that variable u came from. Let's figure out where the uh, footer got included from first. So this is index2.html. Uh, and uh, if we'll uh, recall, uh, if I uh, look at uh, uh, index.js, I've got an index2 that loads index2.html. Uh, if I look at app.js, uh, I've got uh, a um, place where I call in one, and then way down at the bottom, uh, I uh, call in uh, page uh, two. There it is. Uh, and so uh, app.get2 roots index2 ties into my roots uh, index.js. That uh, index ties into uh, my uh, index2.html. Uh, and so I'm doing something in this uh, roots index.js uh, that uh, should note. Uh, that is that I'm uh, creating a variable. Index.js is just a, uh, a, a JavaScript file. And in that variable, I'm saying uh, var user equals rep.user. And in here, uh, in uh, the exports in the roots, uh, I've got both a request, rec, and a response, res. Uh, and so I'm rendering the response. Uh, but the request has attached to it the HTML or HTTP basic authentication uh, information. Uh, so the username is there. And so I'm saying that the request.user is being assigned to the variable user. And then in the response rendering, I'm adding the set of locals. And I'm saying that u gets the value of the variable user. And so that's why when I get all the way over on uh, footer.ejs, I'm able to say caret percent equals u percent caret. And that actually gets replaced properly with the name of the logged in user. So this doesn't make a um, whole lot of sense perhaps at the moment until I uh, go and uh, look at uh, the structure of that request object. Uh, and uh, just to prove I am in fact getting authentication, I'm going to close all of my uh, windows and uh, open this guy back up. Uh, and uh, actually, maybe before I do, uh, let me uh, go back to logging that uh, request object. And we can look in that request object for a moment, which means I'll have to restart this. Chug along and think about it. There we go. And I'll come back over to my incognito window, which I just reopened. And I will look at localhost 3000 slash 2. And actually, before I do, uh, let me uh, just prove to you I can uh, go to localhost 3000 without any authentication. Uh, but when I go into 2, it's now going to ask me for authentication. I had another window open uh, that was still logged into the page. That's why it wasn't previously. And so in here, it's now loaded up that page, which means that my whole request object is going to be sitting over here. And there's just a bunch of stuff we don't need in that request object. And I won't go through what all is in there, uh, except for to, uh, to, to say that there's a lot. Uh, 
um, it uh, spits out uh, uh, the state of the uh, yeah, the buffer and all the variables in your domain table and how you're connecting uh, over the network and uh, uh, everything else. Uh, but uh, at the bottom of this whole page uh, is uh, this uh, uh, variable user. And so user equals Derek. And it's that variable user uh, that uh, is uh, uh, being pulled off into the variable user off of the request user, then logged with that whole string of stuff that we just saw, and then attached to uh, the local variables to this variable u. And that variable u uh, is uh, uh, what is accessible from the uh, EJS template because it's part of the application local variable stack. The other way that we add something to the application local variable stack uh, uh, is uh, shown from uh, inside uh, app.js uh, uh, here, is that uh, the way I've been calling each of these routes that get defined is with app use and app get, um, all of these things are talking to the application object. The application object also has a variable called locals, and that's the set of local variables uh, that will be available to the templating engine in order to construct the pages that it creates. And so I can directly declare a local variable here. So I'm declaring a variable sum var and setting it to the value test var. And then when I'm over here in index2.html, uh, I actually have uh, this um, little call uh, uh, percent uh, or uh, caret percent equals sum var percent caret. And that's uh, showing uh, its uh, value of uh, test var because I've added it to the locals uh, inside app.js here. So those are the two ways that you can uh, create variables that your template can then uh, uh, call in. You can either uh, pass them in during the uh, response render, or you can populate a local variable. And the local variable part uh, is very, very useful because app.js is where you're going to actually make the calls to your database. And so if, for instance, you're populating your database uh, with a uh, list of database items, uh, you can just plug that into a local variable using app.locals, uh, and then your templating engine on your HTML page can create the HTML page with the contents of that database. So that's a way of getting back from uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, the database your items to populate your page with. Um, questions about EJS? I feel like we've gone through the syntax of EJS, which is fairly uh, simple, uh, and only just kind of briefly run through uh, the uh, logistics of each EJS in your sample application. Uh, what else do we need to cover about EJS in here? Okay. Then I shall leave EJS, I believe and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, understanding the uh, a sample website. Uh, and so what I wanted to uh, do with this uh, is uh, get the other direction. I just talked about how EJS uh, can uh, be uh, used to uh, populate your web page with the data from your database. Uh, but uh, I suspect none of you have yet figured out how to populate your database from the web page that uh, the sample application has some of that code in there, uh, but uh, it's fairly complex and obfuscated and we haven't walked through it yet. Uh, so I wanted to show a simpler example uh, of how you actually populate a database from your web page so you can start to use that to uh, use the web page for your uh, own application. Let me close this guy back down again. Uh, well, actually, let me not. Uh, let me, uh, first of all, uh, add a... Uh, a car here, uh, just to prove to myself that it is connecting and uh, adding cars. Yep, it is. A car was added. Um, and I don't plug them out anywhere. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me go up to my uh, Cloudant database uh, and uh, we'll look for that uh, car that's just been added. Remember, uh, we got to here by going to your uh, Bluemix. Uh, uh, a, a server page at Clown Foundry, yeah, clicking on your database uh, and then saying launch to launch the database tool. And for each one of these items, uh, I've got uh, an ID, which is just randomly generated, uh, a revision, uh, which we don't care about, uh, a name, which is a car, and a value of Volvo. And I think I had one previously in there that I'm just testing it out with, uh, yeah, Nissan. So basically my cars that I'm typing in on my web page are making it up to my database and I want to walk through the code in the application uh, that's making them do that.
So we're going to start with uh, app.js, uh, and I want to uh, point out a couple things in app.js. Uh, the first is that uh, my app use authentication uh, is sitting right here above my uh, uh, root two, uh, um, and that means that I could log on to the root of the website or uh, to root one uh, without authentication, uh, but everything below here in apps.js requires authentication. And so that's why I got asked for my credentials uh, before I uh, logged on to uh, uh, localhost 3002. The next thing is, is that uh, I've got uh, this post root that is at uh, API cars. And so remember uh, when we were talking about CRUD applications uh, that uh, we wanted to uh, have uh, uh, the uh, uh, create, replace, update, and delete uh, uh, be uh, basically on separate commands and that this uh, roughly corresponded uh, to uh, 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 post uh, 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 put, uh, um, wait, CRUD, uh, create uh, post, uh, 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 replace, uh, 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 put, um, uh, update, uh, put, really? Delete, get. Where's my get? Uh, my get in there uh, was uh, 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 supposed to be in there somewhere. Anyways, um, uh, it's getting late. Um, so so uh, this is the uh, types of HTTP uh, messages. Uh, uh, the uh, gets, the puts, uh, the uh, posts, and the uh, deletes. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, this is a post, and when you're uh, putting a uh, new item into the database and you use a post message, uh, uh, then the response to this uh, can uh, have it uh, come through the, uh, the database. And so I'm doing a couple things in response to getting a, a message to API cards. Uh, and uh, I'm setting up a variable ID. I'm putting the name as request body name and the value uh, as uh, request body value. I'm logging these. I'm then doing a Cloudant specific thing that if it gets a null string, it randomly generates an ID. This is because I don't want to keep track of what IDs I'm giving to items in my database. I just wanted to generate an ID automatically. I'm coming back to our discussion of uh, database principles. Uh, uh, when you've got a uh, NoSQL database, it's basically a list of items, uh, and there must be a unique key that's one of those items, or that's one of the, uh, the elements of that list of items. Uh, and so I could pass an ID through uh, and just start at zero and do sequential numbers and make sure each one's unique. Uh, and uh, this is kind of what the sample application was, uh, was doing, and it was assigning a row to each of those unique IDs. So when you wanted to delete one, it uh, referenced it by that ID and deleted the right item. I decided for this simple example, I didn't want to do that keeping track of what items were there and just wanted it to randomly generate an ID that was proven to be unique in the database. And so I passed through a null string, um, an empty string, and that's the signal to the database to uh, generate a unique ID using that uh, ID item. And then I'm calling the uh, database insert and passing it the name, passing it the value, uh, passing it the ID, and then have this callback function. And the callback function uh, is just saying if there's an error, uh, to uh, send an error status, and if not, uh, you send a, a, a success status. So the error is 500, the success is 200, uh, and then in the response block. And so that's what's actually talking to my, uh, to my database and doing that insert statement. Now I needed to do a few things to set up my database in order to be able to do that. And I needed to do a couple of things to uh, set up the variables coming off the request body in order to pass the right things into the database. Let's leave the database setup piece alone for just a second and talk about the flow of control to pass variables back into app.js to then plug into your database. So we're going to uh, go look at uh, index.html for a minute. And we'll see that index.html uh, sets up this input with an ID of new car and a button for add car. And the on click is going to call the add car function. And then in the uh, uh, scripts here, it has a script index2.js. And so I'm going to come up to uh, my public scripts directory and look at index2.js. And we're just going to walk through this, uh, uh, this whole file. Uh, uh, the uh, REST data API cars. Uh, this is just saying that the RESTful API that I have created uh, is at API cars. 
And so that's uh, what it's going to uh, send through as the uh, URL uh, that remember in app.js, I defined a response to a post to API cards. Um, I'm not actually using uh, enter or default items. I, I, they're just leftovers from uh, what I uh, previously had in there. Um, I don't think I'm uh, using item anymore either. Uh, this I uh, had started to increment, uh, but uh, uh, didn't uh, bother finishing on the uh, thing uh, when I was thinking about counting the uh, items and keeping it uh, uh, with my own generated IDs rather than the automatically generated IDs. But the uh, useful stuff in here is this add car function. And so remember, this is being called every time that uh, you press the button to uh, add a new car. I'm console logging, saying that I'm adding a car. And then I am uh, setting up a data variable. And this data variable has the name car and the value of document.getElementById newcar.value. And uh, so new car was the ID that I assigned to the text input field. And remember, a text input field in HTML has a value uh, associated with it that is the text that uh, that input field contains. And then I'm sending that using this HXR post uh, 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 call to the API slash cars, the rest data, with the uh, data contained in it. And if uh, it succeeds, nothing happens. If there's an error, it call, calls console error. And so this HSR post uh, function, uh, which we don't have to care too much about, you don't have to define it, uh, but uh, uh, if you want to see how it is defined, it's in utils.js. Uh, uh, um, but it's sending that data on through uh, as a uh, post message uh, um, that uh, gets picked up in app.js. And it's in app.js that that data packet gets unwrapped. And that data packet has in it, of course, a name and a value which get plugged into the database. So that's kind of how the loop works, uh, that uh, app.js talks to your database, app.js uh, picks up the uh, post messages uh, that the website sends, uh, index uh, uh, 2.js is what is uh, actually calling the post message to send it to app.js in response to the add car button being pressed, and it's pulling the things off your HTML page. Now, this horribly convoluted structure uh, is uh, basically coming about by virtue of the fact that uh, you need a few degrees of indirection from your website uh, in order to uh, handle all of your uh, data manipulation in one place and all of your UI on the, uh, uh, the website in one place. Uh, and because this is uh, all happening uh, possibly on different machines, uh, remember at the very start of this course, we talked about uh, having uh, these uh, CDNs and these banks of uh, uh, distributed web servers uh, allowing scalable uh, systems to be created. Uh, um, these things don't even need to be on the same machine as long as the post messages know where to go to generate a response. Uh, so this is basically a way of doing uh, some uh, fault tolerant networking using HTTP as your transport layer uh, to send messages back and forth to create a distributed application. But in terms of what you're actually doing with your application, it'll all be running on one machine inside your IBM Bluemix uh, instance uh, as Node.js uh, handling both sides of this interaction. Um, questions about uh, that uh, uh, web page uh, through uh, yeah, the JS file, through the post, back to app.js talking to the uh, database. Does that all sound like something that if you looked at my project and pieced it back out, you'd know what you're looking at again? At least well enough to ask me questions on Slack? People aren't using Slack very much anymore, by the way. I like Slack because uh, it lets everybody else see your questions when you ask it in the general channel. Uh, um, but uh, I think people are asking me questions in email as much as they are on, uh, on Slack these days, or more than they are on Slack these days. Either way, it's fine. Um, let's talk for a minute about the uh, setup of the database, because that's the other thing that uh, I said was, uh, it was different here uh, that I'd modified from the original example. Um, if we go back to looking at app.js, I have left it here so that both databases work and made a few changes uh, so that we can both have our original database uh, and this new uh, uh, document uh, that uh, is being used for cars. And I've needed to make a few changes to allow me to do that. The first is that uh, I've uh, introduced this uh, variable Cloudant with a capital C 
and I'm using that just to pass off to my new to my two cloud instances uh, that uh, will act actually be used for my two databases. So I've got the database originally from the uh, sample with the file attachments, my favorites. Uh, that's what the sample started with. And then I've got Cloud2 that's being used uh, for uh, my uh, cars example. I've also got two sets of credentials because the DB name uh, is part of the credentials. Uh, and so the original one was called my sample DB, and this is my simple DB, just to make things confusing. The next thing that I uh, had in here uh, was um, uh, get DB credentials. That was all the same. That was just getting your uh, VCAP dash local file if you were running locally. And uh, then a knit DB connection. Uh, that was uh, uh, actually being defined uh, as uh, using that uh, VCAP services uh, either on Bluemix or locally. Uh, and then getting credentials for uh, both database uh, one and database two. And then setting up the uh, uh, credentials URL for the uh, two databases. And then here is where I'm making my require statement. Remember, a require statement pulls in an NPM package that does something for you. In this case, that NPM package is the package that talks to the cloud and database. And so it used to be uh, that uh, I was actually uh, pulling this in uh, a little bit differently. And uh, if we go look at um, My commit history, I should be able to look in here and uh, see, no, I haven't changed it there yet. <laughs> nope, I still haven't changed it there. Sorry, I made a number of uh, changes as I, uh, went in and uh, set up the instantiation code. There it is, okay. So originally uh, this was being called uh, by uh, this form where I said cloudant lowercase equals require cloudant uh, uh, with uh, dbcredentials.url being passed in explicitly. And when I only needed one instance of the cloudant uh, to talk to one database, this was perfectly sufficient. Uh, but when I wanted to uh, actually uh, have two of them, uh, I could no longer instantiate it this way anymore. And you can't require the same package more than once. And so I had to introduce this uh, cloud with a capital C uh, to uh, be the uh, package itself in its uninstantiated form. Uh, and then I call that uh, with the credentials for uh, database one and then database two. And that allows me to set up these two lowercase cloud and cloud and cloud and two uh, that are talking to database one and database two respectively. So just watch in here for that, uh, those two forms of uh, passing a variable to a uh, required package uh, that you can break it out to uh, call it more than once if you need to uh, rather than requiring it more than once. Um, so from in there, uh, I've got my two instances of the cloud and DB. I'm, uh, uh, creating the first one, that one uh, was uh, left from before, um, and then I'm creating the second one. Uh, I cannot uh, create DB uh, if uh, it's already been created, uh, it might already exist. And then I simply uh, declare it as uh, DB2 equals cloud and use and uh, have my credentials. And then from there, everything is exactly the same, and I just use it with that uh, uh, DB2.insert statement uh, in order to insert new items into the, uh, the database. So considerably simpler structure uh, than we uh, previously had uh, to uh, uh, pull things off the disk and then munch them together and then send them up to the database. Uh, so I would, if you're uh, looking at your application, use this as a, uh, a model uh, for uh, uh, doing your database interactions. Uh, again, uh, looking at my changes to uh, initiate the second database, uh, although you don't necessarily need to do that, uh, you could just uh, repurpose the database you have to a new name and use that new name for your application. Uh, but uh, the reason I did it this way uh, is uh, something that I wanted to talk about uh, that I've seen a few of you guys fall into uh, of uh, uh, just how I pick apart a sample that I'm not thoroughly familiar with. Uh, and I try to keep everything working for just as long as I can. Uh, so uh, if I'm going to uh, need a new database, I'll leave the old database in there and I'll leave the home page still working like the sample did. Uh, and I'll try and recreate that sample on my own page uh, 
pulling piece by piece as I need it. Uh, and it's only after it's all working on my own page that I'll feel confident in removing the pieces that the original sample required. And this means that I don't get into that uh, state uh, where uh, just nothing works and I don't know why it works, uh, which is the most frustrating state to be in uh, because you don't know what to go fix. Uh, and so this is the same reason that I actually run everything locally rather than up on Bluenix all the time uh, is that I want to be able to change one line or one variable at a time, uh, uh, start it and run again and see, and uh, then change something else and run again and see. And I flip back and forth uh, in my local browser with every single change I make. Uh, and it's only when I have a set of them that uh, have this block of functionality, I go ahead and push that up to GitHub. Uh, and then I can go change another set of things. Uh, and when that works, I push it up to GitHub. Uh, uh, but I never break what's there uh, until I'm absolutely certain that mine is working and I don't need what the sample I started from uh, so I can throw it away now. Um, and this just uh, works better for me uh, than uh, going and uh, having it side by side and trying to look at it and keep everything the same. Uh, it's amazing how small an error is that uh, it, it will totally screw you up, even a missed semicolon or a yeah, misspelled variable or something, uh, which when I'm transcribing from file to file is really, really easy to do. So a single change at a time, leave the original sample running just as long as you can, uh, get yours up and running beside it, uh, and then slowly break, a, 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 a break away and then delete the pieces you don't need anymore uh, once you're certain that you don't need them. Um, I was going to go through that discussion in a lot more detail uh, walking through my individual changes, but I don't really think I need to. I think the point's kind of made, and if you need to look up at my OffDB uh, sample to look at kind of the steps I do uh, in moving from a sample to something more complete, you'll find those steps useful. Um, but uh, yeah, let's instead use the uh, rest of the uh, class time in here uh, to try and get your uh, first uh, database uh, uh, changes uh, up and running. And uh, so the homework that uh, I have for uh, this week uh, is uh, actually in two parts. There's a homework 10 and a homework 11. Uh, and the reason for this is that I promised that I would have one homework to displace your lowest grade homework. Uh, and to do that, we need 12 homeworks in the class. Uh, and uh, we only have 11 weeks with the reading break. And so I miscounted wrong again. Um, so uh, if you already uh, have decided you don't need to throw away a homework, feel free to ignore one of these homeworks and only do one of them. Uh, if you do have a homework grade you need to replace, uh, uh, go ahead and have one of these replace uh, one of those two. Uh, and in fact, what I'll do, of course, is just throw away the lowest uh, homework grade and all of the, yeah, the set. So uh, uh, whatever, uh, whenever that hits is, uh, is great. Um, in the first one, uh, though, uh, I'm going to have you guys uh, uh, create a website using Node.js that uses basic authentication, uh, using that HTTP auth module that we uh, looked at uh, in the uh, first exercise today. Yeah. And don't allow the page to be displayed uh, if uh, you haven't given the uh, proper credentials. Uh, um, use an EJS partial to provide a uh, footer that shows the logged in user. We walked through uh, that on my example. Uh, so basically, you just have to pass through from the app.js uh, the uh, locals with that logged in user off of the uh, request.user object. Uh, and um, then uh, submit that as a GitHub repository and email a screenshot of that running on your machine. You do not need to push this one up to Bluemix. Uh, if you have that running uh, using an MPM, MPM start method uh, in any kind of sample application on your machine, you're golden. Um, just leave it at that. The one I would like to uh, see up on uh, Bluemix uh, is a uh, project of animals and how many legs they have uh, and allow the user to enter an animal from the web page. Uh, just the same way as I did in my cars application and my AuthDB uh, site here. Uh, as long as you're pushing up to a cloud database, uh, uh, yeah, then you're good. Uh, you uh, don't need to actually display them back on the page. We'll talk about how to do queries and display uh, back to the page next week. Uh, um, and each person in the group should have their own project for this. I do want this done uh, individually rather than just being on your group project site. Uh, it can be on your uh, group project Bluemix, uh, but uh, create your own starter package and give it your own name to, uh, to do that. Um, and so for this one, I want you to submit the GitHub pro uh, repository of the running website uh, and then uh, just a screenshot of the database. Yeah. Uh, you can do the same page for both, sure. Yeah. Yep. I just didn't want to uh, mix them to, to, together and the requirements because I wanted to call them two homeworks. But yeah, no, it can absolutely be the same page if you want to be. Questions on these two? Uh, feel free to, in the next 45 minutes, either uh, start working on it with me around to solve problems. I would suggest this, given the problems this last week, um, or uh, run away and call it a short night, whichever you prefer.
Go. 